Great. Thanks so much for everyone being here. Um, this is the first conference for the public health forum for the public health forum of the Northwest. And it's really exciting to see how many people were able to come tonight, which is which is great. The public health forum really started with um, myself and George realizing that this year, essentially, a lot of the conversations we were having, whether it be on the wards or in the mess or in the corridor, were essentially about issues and topics of public health we realized there was an appetite to discuss and to learn more about public health issues that were affecting not only society, but the very way we worked as junior doctors. While there was this appetite, we felt that there wasn't this platform for junior doctors to have this voice and to learn more about public health from, from leaders in the field. We feel really excited that this has managed to come to fruition now. And we're very, very honored and lucky to have two incredible speakers here tonight. We have um, Professor Ray and Sir Harry Burns, and we're very grateful for their time. So I believe that um, Professor Ray is going to speak first, and George is going to introduce Professor Ray, and then we'll have uh, Sir Harry Burns speak. Thanks, Carlo. So it's an honour to introduce our first speaker. Professor Maggie Ray is the President of the UK Faculty of Public Health. Professor Ray has been incredible in supporting the, uh, the Public Health Forum since its initiation and we're very lucky to hear her speak tonight. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to, uh, to be with us tonight. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and it's always um, fantastic to share a stage with Sir Harry. Now, we, colleagues, we had a little bit of technical difficulty before we started and I can see that Harry has joined us. So, Harry, I just want to check if you're happy for me to go first. Um, what we're trying to do, everyone, is just um, elevate Harry to a panellist so he can do his presentation. So I think the best thing for, for me to do, George and Carlo, is to start my presentation and then by that time I'm sure we'll have um, made sure Harry's got the, the correct link. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight and it's a real pleasure to work with Carlo, George and this new network. What a fantastic thing to be doing in your free time to want to engage in public health. I think that's just absolutely fantastic. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen and um, show you some slides. I hope I'm going to show you some slides. <clears throat> That's great. Can you all see the slide now? Uh, I can't. I'm not sure. Excellent. Well, I'm, I think everyone will be able to see it. That's great. Thank you, everyone. So tonight's topic is pandemics. Why do they happen and what comes next? So um, for us in public health, um, who've, I think, dealt with many pandemics, um, certainly I've dealt with many pandemics over the years, we always say it's not a question of when we have... Um, Sorry, it's really... I don't think we can see the slides. Sorry. Ah, oh, right, okay. Um, maybe if we ask Mag, if she can... Yes, perhaps Mag could share them then. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, it's usually so smooth with these things. So sorry, is that a bit better? Thank yeah. you, Mag, for doing that. And Mag, if you move on to the next slide for me, please. So as I say, tonight's topic is um, all about pandemics. And for us in public health, the question is always, when is the next pandemic, not if? Because part of our role is to spend a lot of time thinking about pandemics, preparing for pandemics and if there was ever a time um, is there ever a time that we're not thinking about that well probably not although we always hope that there'll be um, considerable time between one pandemic and the next 
I think what we're going to explore tonight is can we expect more pandemics into the future? What can we do to be better prepared? I, I think we would all acknowledge the, the sort of best endeavours that people in the UK have had in terms of the response, but it was probably too little uh, and, and not quick enough in terms of the immediate response. And obviously, we will surely come out in the, um, the inquiries that follow this, that probably all the cuts that were made and the lack of preparedness has been a significant factor. Having said that, this is probably the most difficult pandemic that anyone's had to deal with, in, certainly in our, our lifetimes. And then we're going to look at the impacts of the pandemic on health inequalities. We had a lot of health inequalities in our country before the pandemic, and that's certainly something that Sir Harry and I have worked on together in the past. And a big part of public health is trying to tackle health inequalities. And we already knew that life expectancy is stalled in our country. However, the pandemic, COVID-19, has greatly exacerbated those uh, health inequalities that were already there. Next slide, please, Meg. So just to look at the, for those that are less familiar with pandemics, um, the global pandemics we have faced have been from, um, you'll have heard lots of talk around the problems we had with Spanish flu, and it's really a comparison now to the kind of difficulties and the, the amount of death that occurred in relation to the Spanish flu. But just thinking about the, the various um, situations we've had to deal with, not all have been determined to be um, global pandemics, but a really, really interesting array. And I think when you look at that slide, you can see the pace in the years between the pandemics uh, or the, the major the global incidents. And um, I, I'm, I'm definitely of the view that all pandemics come to an end. And it's um, very comforting to know that we have tackled some of the most difficult ones and they have come to an end. I think smallpox is probably the greatest public health achievement in terms of eradication. The eradication of smallpox was, um, as I say, probably one of the greatest achievements. But when we look at um, things such as SARS, I think SARS was a really interesting pandemic because in some ways, if we'd been worse hit in our country, we may have been better prepared. Because if you look at the countries that were most hit by SARS, those are the ones that took the beginning of the COVID experience very, very seriously, because they had very difficult and, and um, challenging experiences with that type of coronavirus in the past. And we're probably much more agile and better prepared for it. Um, of course, we did get affected by SARS and one shouldn't really underplay that. But it wasn't the impact that it was in some of the countries like um, uh, Singapore, Korea, even, even Canada was, was much more affected. And what happened at the end of SARS? Well, we never ever got a... Um, we never, we, we didn't actually manage to produce a, a vaccine for SARS. Um, and it was notoriously difficult to produce vaccines for these types of um, viruses. And then it just kind of fiddled, fizzled out. That's not a very technical public health term, is it? But that's in effect what happened. And there's a wonderful report um, uh, that was done in the look back of SARS by one of the ex-presidents of the faculty, Sean Griffiths, who, and you may have heard Sean talking on the television from time to time about the SARS experience. It was a really, really interesting one. And then of course, with things like H1N1, I'm sure most people on the call uh, remember H1N1, um, a global pandemic spread very quickly across the world. And um, I remember distinctly when I was the director of public health in Wiltshire, because we had one of the first cases, someone had um, been on holiday to 
Cancun and come back with H1N1. And again, it was a, a major, major incident at the time. But rather interestingly, the kind of effects it had on different, um, the different populations and children were a little bit more affected than they were, uh, were seeing from COVID-19. And for most, a lot of people, it was a mild 24, 40 hour illness. But again, we had a large number of deaths from that, that particular pandemic. I think the other one that um, is sort of worthy of note, we were doing, um, you probably realize in public health and maybe you do it too in your work if you're not from public health, do you ever do those scenarios where you practice a major incident and you practice for a pandemic? I'm certainly sure we should be doing an awful lot more of them in the times to come, given how ill-prepared we were. Um, we practiced one about two weeks ago that was about um, a Zika exposure in our country. And you probably realize that there's quite a lot of monitoring of mosquitoes in, in our country and there's quite a lot of concern about um, perhaps in, in the future uh, linked to climate change are we going to see more, um, more um, malaria or different diseases borne by mosquitoes and that was really interesting it was interesting to really challenge ourselves about what in this country would we do if we, had, we were exposed to the Zika virus and how, how would we deal with it um, so I think we will see an awful lot more. And then probably for me in my lifetime, one of the most significant ones um, was HIV AIDS. I mean, that was an incredible experience to work on HIV and AIDS. And many of the procedures that we've implemented for HIV and AIDS were universal precautions that we use today, still today, the introduction of universal precautions. So we probably could spend an awful lot more time on this, but I, I just wanted to give you a flavour of some of the things that we have been dealing with in the public health community over time. And um, as I say, we could spend a lot of time, and I know some of my colleagues that have been working on Ebola would actually um, say that that's, that's been relatively easier than working on COVID-19. I find that quite extraordinary given the, the sort of, the dangerous, the, you know, the, how dangerous um, Ebola is, but it is a very challenging, uh, challenging one. And um, anthrax is probably worth a mention too, because really the, most of the anthrax and the, the threats of anthrax in this country have come from um, fears of, dirty bombs, white powder attacks, and um, I think it was only last week the Prime Minister Boris Johnson was talking about the need to be prepared for bioterrorist attacks. And in my career, I was actually um, given the job of chairing the post-government response to September the 11th. And in London at that time, there was, um, fortunately, they were not, they were threats, but there was probably about 100 threats a day coming into um, for the country to deal with. So that again was a very interesting one. So you can see it's a whole range of issues, not just, um, not, there's, there's chemical issues there and not just, um, not just the issues of communicable disease. Next slide, please. And then I thought it was probably worth the, worth the mention tonight about the threat of zoonotic viruses, because in recent times, this obviously is what we've been experiencing. The interface between animals and human beings are often the underlying cause in these global pandemics. And what are we doing about that threat? Are we working hard enough on that threat? Is there a worldwide campaign? And I think the, um, the, 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 WHO, the WHO campaign, the One World, One Health, makes it clear that we must treat planetary, animal and human health as interlinked and dependent on one another. And I think this is probably one of the biggest threats that we've got in the years to come. And I think it'd be very interesting in your discussions, 
in the future, um, Carlo and George, with your group, if you are um, exploring the much, much bigger issues of public health and how can you tackle these worldwide threats? Because we can see that the way people live their lives and their interaction with animals in a far-flung... I mean, I'd never heard of Wuhan before. Uh, I think Wuhan is actually, is it not twinned with Manchester? I think it is. I was listening to the chief executive of uh, Manchester City today and um, she seemed to, um, she, I'm sure she said that she was linked to Wuhan. Who would have thought that, that we would have been, that would have been brought into our lives from such a, an event far, far away. That is, of course, unless you, you may be following the theory that it's actually been released from labs. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure what theory you're, you're, uh, you're interested in. But certainly it's had a big impact in our lives and the rest of the world. Thank you. Next slide, please. So probably it's important uh, for us in public health to really focus on the health inequality impacts of the pandemic. And as, we, as I was saying earlier, the COVID-19 impacts pandemic are far more complex than the immediate threat of the illness and infection and the way in which the people in the poorest communities have been so adversely affected. And obviously people in um, minority, the, the minority ethnic populations too, they've had um, a much worse experience compared to the rest of the population. So the mortality that follows the social gradient, I thought you would be interested in seeing that. It's quite extraordinary, but from a public health perspective, that's normally what happens in all diseases. The effects are worse on the most deprived and the poorest populations. And again, we're just, we're seeing that play out with COVID. Thank you. And can I just check if there's one more slide, Meg, or if that's, yes, I think this is the last one, isn't it? So um, what's the way out of this? And I think the, the best way out of this is obviously the access to the vaccination and um, getting the equitable access to the vaccination. Um, I, um, I think the approach in the UK has been very, very speedy, responsive. It's certainly been one of the success stories of the pandemic. But I think it also needs to be something that's targeted to the populations who are less likely to come forward. We do have quite a lot of people who are hesitant about taking the vaccine. We also know that some people find it difficult, very difficult to get time off work. And, you know, they, they do struggle to get to their appointments. And there's also communities that aren't really engaged in looking after their health, preventative health, how can we get them more engaged? And so what we really need is a real focus on this to make sure that we can be persuasive to people, to listen to their fears, to listen to their concerns, to listen to their doubts. And that's just in our own country. And when you look at the variation of vaccine update, up, uptake, just in the populations we're doing at the moment, if I exclude, well, I think it probably does include some of the health and social care workers, but we can see wide variation. And that variation is again, mostly linked to um, deprived communities or target or populations that we need to target to make sure we get a better, a bit much better uptake. Because this is the classic problem. If we don't protect everyone, we're all going to suffer because this is everyone's problem. And I suppose that also takes us to our worldwide mission and how do we try and get a strategy that really uh, improves the uptake in other poorer countries. And I think there's some major efforts going on about that at the moment, but do we wait to all the wealthy countries are vaccinated first before we start the poorest ones or do we try and move forward together? I think I would prefer we tried to move forward together because we've seen that 
as soon as the um, lockdowns are removed and people start to move around more, we will see this virus spread and we will see variants. Now variants of course have been a feature of this pandemic already and are likely to continue. So we have to take a global approach to this. We have to help and support trying to get the vaccine programme. It's not just the money for vaccines. If any of you have worked overseas in poor countries, you'll realise that you need the infrastructure to make the vaccination programme work. So we have to have a worldwide mission on this. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Carla and George, and I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for that talk. That was a tremendous talk. And points that sort of specifically stuck out to me was the sort of relationship between the preparedness or how effective a country was in relationship to how, how hard it dealt with SARS, which I find really interesting. And also the sort of the vaccination uptake in relation to deprivation, which is a really interesting point, which I'd never really considered. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I've now got the incredible honour of introducing Sir Harry Burns. He is a professor of global health and the current president of the BMA. And Sir Harry was chief medical officer for Scotland between 2005 and 2014. We're incredibly lucky to hear him speak today. And thank you so much for giving up your time considering how busy your schedule is. And now I'll hand over to Sir Harry. I think you're on mute, Sir Harry. Sorry. Right, you hear me now? Can people see the screen? Okay, yes. see my slide, right, okay. So I'll start off with going back to some pandemics, but some a bit earlier than Maggie has just spoken about. Thing about pandemics is they have tremendous geopolitical impact historically. If you go back, for example, 2000 years to, the Antonine Plague, for example, um, Antonine Plague was probably either smallpox or measles. It affected the eastern Mediterranean, probably brought, brought back from further east uh, by Roman soldiers. And it has been estimated to have killed about five million people. Um, it decimated the Roman army, and the Roman army was virtually impotent for many years, and they, they were the dominant geopolitical force in the Mediterranean at the time. Um, later on, the plague of Justi Justinian was probably the first episode of the bubonic plague, again brought back to, um, to the Byzantine Empire and the various port cities around the Mediterranean by soldiers. It's reckoned that that killed 25 million people. That was nothing compared to the Black Death, the bubonic plague uh, of the 14th century. And its geopolitical impact, killing about 200 million people around the world, what happened there was that, in essence, it killed lots of workers. The poor who were living in dirty accommodation, they were bitten by the, the fleas and the rats and so on that were carrying the, the bubonic plague. And after that, the con conditions for working people became much better. There was far fewer of them. They were paid more, they had better food and so on. Um, but it, that happened at the cost of about 200 million lives. The 1918 flu pandemic, my um, grandfather who fought in the first world war remembered the flu pandemic and i remember him telling me how horrible it was uh, to have it 50 million people killed by that flu 36 million estimated dead in the hiv and aids uh, pandemic <clears throat> which again has transformed so much of our society the really interesting one from my point of view was the impact of European migration to the Americas. Probably it was smallpox that wiped out the Aztecs 
when the Spanish landed in South America, they took with them smallpox. They had herd immunity to it, but the Indians had never um, uh, never had this before. And that was probably what allowed the Spanish to take over lots of uh, South America. And similarly with the uh, North, or American Indians, they too had huge mortality by coming into contact with the, the Europeans and their smallpox. So pandemics, the, impl the, the impact of pandemics can last for centuries. You may get rid of the bug, but geopolitically it, they have huge, Im huge impacts. And Basically, what we are seeing is probably causing this, for a start, global travel. That was the problem in these early pandemics. You know, there's Roman soldiers coming back from Mesopotamia, bringing the bug. We fly all the way around the world in a day and so on, and we can pick up all sorts of things. Urbanization, the fact that people live together, World Bank, reckons that there by the end by about 2030 there will be about 10 cities in the world with populations greater than 40 million people in one city just imagine how a, a new disease could romp through that kind of city especially if there's lots of poor people there living in a hand-to-mouth existence climate change is important as uh, temperature warms up, will we see malaria carrying mosquitoes move back into Spain, Italy and so on, where they were in Roman times. Um, but the other thing is that deforestation and the use of, you know, destroying traditional habitats for animals forces them into contact with humans, and that's where the, the bugs that the animals are carrying get into the, the human um, chain. The other thing that WHO are talking about are health worker shortages. If you can get onto these things quickly, help people to isolate, support people through the illness and so on, then you have a chance of limiting it. But of course, in uh, uh, countries in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa and so on, it's all hand to mouth as far as health workers are concerned. Maggie mentioned the impact of deaths across the population and particularly amongst poor and BAME people. The least deprived death rates in England are the pale blue line at the bottom and the most deprived are the red line during the two peaks that we've had so far. You can see very significant differences between the two levels of mortality. And I have no doubt that when the Office for National Statistics later on this year comes to calculate life expectancy in affluent and deprived people in Britain, you will see a significant widening in inequality in survival and mortality in these two groups. The issue around why do poor people, why are they more likely to die? Why are BAME more people more likely to die? Is something that is complex. Um, we have some ideas around it, uh, which I don't have time to go into tonight. But it's not just simply a fact that poor people are more likely to smoke and more likely to be obese and so on, which they are, that will produce some increases. But there are a load of other um, biophysiological reasons why they, that we're seeing this picture. The other thing that was interesting, uh, Richard Horton in The Lancet last December raised the issue of syndemics rather than pandemics. Syndemics, the synthesis of lots of different drivers coming together, the interactions between biology, social circumstances, economic circumstances, so on, which can all have an impact on the outcome of disease. Can you control it? Can you reduce mortality and so on? And I must say, I like that approach, thinking about pandemics as multifactorial insults on, on, on people. 
This notion that WHO have been talking about One Health, um, on the left-hand side of this slide, as you look at it, there is the healthcare paradigm. We think, you know, we have to prevent things. That's what public health tries to do. If we can't prevent it, we have to diagnose what's going on. We have to find a cure for it. We have to rehabilitate people. There is a very linear um, pattern of thinking there. Doctors deal with illness and we have to prevent illness and cure it and make people better from it. The One Health paradigm is, to my mind, much more interesting. It's a kind of circular paradigm. At the top, we've got to try and protect life through protecting the environment. Um, you know, we're not just protecting human life, we're protecting the animals that inhabit and blamelessly are carrying these, um, these bugs around with them. And that requires an intersectoral approach, it requires not just the healthcare system, but it acquires planning law, it requires farmers, it requires a, a governmental approach to protecting the environment so that animals aren't forced to look for new places to live and so on. The next circle is data, it should be data analytics. I mistyped that. This is something that we've been doing at my university. We have some very, very clever uh, modelers, data modelers and artificial intelligence people. And of course, in Scotland, we have a very, very highly linked data system. Everyone in Scotland has a thing called the Community Health Index. And you can use the CHI number to link all sorts of data. So we have recently got agreement to link health data, um, school data, finding out how frequently children in a family go to school, police data, who's calling them, whose homes are they called out to in emergencies, housing association data, um, which houses get broken windows or kicked in doors and so on, um, and a range of other data sets. We've, we are on the verge of linking all of this together in a way that doesn't infringe general data protection regulations. We don't know who these individuals are. We pull the data together and we use that to identify families and individuals who are living difficult, chaotic lives. And we've also got ideas around artificial intelligence approaches to use, the, use that data analytics and analytics to begin to encourage social and healthcare partnerships to intervene in supportive ways, not going to people who are living difficult lives and telling them what they need, but going to those people and asking them what would make their lives better and supporting them to getting it. That's another lecture. Uh, that I'd be happy to do sometime in the future, that approach. But all of that leads to sustainability. And in Scotland, again, I'm on uh, Nicola Sturgeon's Council of Economic Advisors, and what we're talking about is inclusive economic growth, growth which is sustainable, comes from sustainable activities and is shared equitably across the population. So the One Health approach looks at health of the planet, health of the people, and the health of the systems that bind them together. The other thing that's important is not to oversimplify the issue of inequality. You know, when I was a surgeon, this is what I believed. We were an unhealthy lot because we smoked too much, we ate the wrong kind of food, we drank too much, and if only we would do the right thing and adopt healthy habits, everything would be fine. And actually, when I went into public health, I quickly realized that only one of those statements is true, and regrettably, it's the one about the drink. Our life expectancy in Scotland, this is a slide showing life expectancy in 16 Western European countries going back 160 years, back to 1850. 
And you can see that for most of this time, Scottish life expectancy has been at the middle of the European average. It's only since about the 1950s we begin to see Scotland drifting to the back of the pack. And that's the rate of growth of life expectancy in the richest 20% of the population, and that's the poorest 20% of the population. Scotland's relatively poor life expectancy nowadays is a reflection of the widening gap in life expectancy since the 1950s, which was the time that men began to lose their jobs as shipyards closed, mines closed, um, steelworks closed and so on. And communities were torn apart as planners saw the need to do away with old buildings and produce new um, multi-storey flats and so on. Something that I once heard described as filing cabinets in the sky for people. It's not because we smoke too much. This slide shows male smoking rates. In this study, Scotland were the third lowest smoking rates in Europe, beaten only by the Finns and Swedes. Another study that I don't have to show you, uh, don't have time to show you, uh, showed that Scottish teenagers were the fifth lowest smokers in Europe. Scottish women are slightly closer to the European average, but we're not where we are because we're the worst smokers in Europe, nor are we the worst eaters in Europe. But again, I don't have time to go into that. My colleague at Glasgow University, um, Alistair Leyland, did a really interesting analysis of mortality inequalities in mortality by five-year age groups in the population. Use the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. The most affluent 20% of the population had this mortality, the most deprived had this mortality in this age range. And you can reduce all the data on that slide down to a single number by subtracting the best from the worst and dividing by the mean. So this slide has a slope index of inequality of just over one. If you do that in five-year age bands, you can then plot the slope index and it will show you which age group has the worst inequality in mortality. And it's not the old folk. They're the ones that traditionally die of heart disease and cancer. Inequality goes up in teenage years, it's at its highest in the 30s and 40s and is coming down in the 50s. And if you start to look at inequality and mortality from individual causes of death. This is ischemic heart disease, obviously. And plot ischemic heart disease inequalities, you can see that it's a relatively minor cause to inequalities in death rates. So what's causing this bulge? Well, it's deaths in young people due to suicide, drugs, alcohol, and violence assault and accidents. Cancer and heart disease is a way up here with stroke. Drugs, alcohol, suicide and violence, if you survive some of these conditions, you're destined to have an increased risk of these further up. So our, our efforts to change things have to start down here. And that, I just show that point to let you know that you should not just make assumptions about data about things like inequalities without looking at it in considerable detail. What do we do about it? Well, this slide I got from a friend at the Nordic School of Public Health, 25 different theories about what causes health, Salus being the Roman goddess of safety and well-being, salutogenesis as opposed to pathogenesis. And what we have been doing with our PhD students is Focusing on this limb here, the people who are turning to drugs, alcohol, violence, and so on in early life, they seem to have a learned helplessness. Um, and the answer is to try and create in them an optimistic outlook, give them a sense of control, a sense of purpose in life, give them confidence in their ability to deal with problems. And we do that by providing them with supportive people to help them. You don't go and tell them they're smoking, so they're stupid. You don't go and tell them to stop drinking, it'll kill them. They know all of that already. Support them to become better people. So that's the kind of approach we're taking. Health inequalities are caused by not enough well-being, not too much illness.
And if we're going to mitigate the impact of the next pandemic, we better get our skates on and start improving well-being in our community. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much um, for that talk. That was incredible. I particularly found the, the points were very interesting with the, the One Health model as well as, um, as, the, as the causes of, of, of mortality within, within Scotland as well. Does anyone have any questions? And I'd be happy to read them out. You can put them in the chat. So for either Professor Ray or Sir Harry. But if not, oh. No, nope. don't think anyone has any questions. So thank you both. <laughs> thank you both so much for your time today. I know I really loved those talks. They were incredible. And I'm sure George feels the same way and everyone that was able to listen to them. And we're really grateful for you guys taking your time out. To yeah, it's a pl pleasure, oh. Carlo, and lovely to see you. Oh, sorry, Give my been... regards to your mum and dad. <laughs> well, there's been one, um, there's been two questions, sorry. If... Oh, right. Sorry, um, so there's one question. Um, what, what are the most effective healthcare interventions to reduce avoidable mortality and reduce inequalities? And that's by David Black. Do you want to, well, okay, I'll go first. Healthcare interventions are low on the list of things to reduce inequalities. It's about support. It's about helping people through difficult circumstances. When we started um, things like uh, our uh, family um, improvement work and so on, asking parents what would make a difference and they would tell you all sorts of things that you would never have thought of. Um, you know, could I get a home help for a day because I'm really overwhelmed by uh, with the work in the house and this kind of thing. So ask people is the starting point what, they, what you think they need. And you will always be surprised by the answers you get. Healthcare, mm, unless you have a very clearly defined Ill, illness that is treatable, then that's fine, but don't assume that's going to narrow health inequalities. Um, there's another question I'll, here. I'll chip in too, if you don't mind. And yeah. um, never, I'm never one to disagree with Sir Harry, of course, because we um, go back a long way. But, um, but I think there's no reason why we don't, as an NHS, do more for people who happen to be deprived. It'd be really good if we could sort out their poverty and uh, their education and their housing and all those things. But actually, I think we could make a huge difference just by picking up some of the coronary heart disease ones. You know, I can still remember as a, a, a young girl growing up in Scotland and going in and finding that you know, someone else's father had died today. And I don't mean died at 60, I mean died in their 30s. And so I, I would like a really strong attention on um, blood pressure. It'd be always good if everyone's blood pressure was good and you could intervene early in that. And I think there's lots of creative ways of getting deprived communities. You know, if you go to where they are, that's difficult at the moment in the pandemic but I think it could be done. Lots of exciting projects have been done around people that go, um, go to football, um, you know, getting people to take more of an interest there. And of course, smoking. I, I, can't, I can't not have a chance to do some more work on smoking. They, that's probably saved many, many lives, the achievements we've made in smoking. So in addition to, I agree with Harry wholeheartedly, but I, I think there are things we can do. And I, th I still believe that um, doctors, nurses, allied health professionals, anyone that the public is getting those trusted services from are very powerful voices in supporting good health. And even just taking an interest in someone can, can actually make a huge difference. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Jonathan, if that's okay. He said, in Liverpool, we have seen one of the highest death rates from COVID-19 in the country. This is even in the context of our city having the additional testing push 
when compared to other local authorities. Do you think this high mortality could reflect the level of deprivation in the city? And do you see a need to tackle this type of geographical disparity in mortality in a targeted, locally relevant approach to COVID-19 going forward? Um, that, that's an interesting one. Uh, in Glasgow Centre for Population and Health, we did a survey looking at inequalities and in comparing Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester. And we found that inequalities were far less in Liverpool and Manchester than they were in Glasgow. Um, and I asked, I remember asking the then Director of Public Health in Liverpool, um, did that surprise her? And I asked about the Toxteth riots of many years ago. And she said, what the Liverpool City Council realised was that these were people who felt sidelined. And after the riots, the council deliberately set out to try and include them and make them feel part of the community, et cetera, et cetera. And it had a significant impact on their well-being. Um, so the evidence that I have, and this study was maybe done about 10 years ago, then Liverpool was not as wide, didn't have such wide inequalities as Glasgow did. Um, and if they've got a worse COVID mortality than Glasgow, then I would be looking perhaps at other explanations. Yes, I was going to add to that. I mean, again, a really interesting question, a really interesting area. But when we've looked at the English data, we've got a sort of crescent in the country where we have got really um, difficult to shift. In fact, infection rates, they're just not shifting. And Liverpool would be within that group. And I think a lot of it is due to um, exposure and people not being able to, even with a test and trace system, not being able to isolate and, and actually avoiding. There's good evidence that people have avoided getting tests because they just can't afford to stay off work. And they're also frightened they'll lose their job if they don't turn up for work because the you know, employment's going to be really a difficult problem. So I, I do think um, when you compare and contrast poverty and deprivation, there, there is a significant problem. But also I think there's lots of people with poor health anyway. I mean, I don't mean people in their 50s and 60s with multiple, um, multiple morbidities. I think it's people in, in younger age range who are, who are just not, they don't have effective immune systems, they're not very healthy. And I think, you know, the age range, certainly in this last wave, has definitely creeped down into a younger age range than we were seeing before. So I think also the, the variant may have a, had the variant may have had a significant impact in, in recent times. And that's that'll all have to come out in the analysis when, when we've got all the data. Um, and do we have I have time for two more questions, I think. So the, there's one saying, how, how would one deal with a, def, a particularly difficult patient? For example, a high-risk patient that has been negatively modelled by social inequalities during their lifetime and is particularly resistant to receiving that help that they need? Um, it, it comes back to my um, belief that a friendly approach is the way to, to deal with it. I mean, I have seen people's lives being transformed by someone reaching out a hand to them and helping them over a difficult um, problem. I mean, I recall before, before the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, uh, I did some work with two town planners who had been sent out to the east end of the city that was where a lot of the building was taking place. And I was interested because that was the area of great inequality. And they told me about, they were knocking on people's doors, asking them what they thought about what was happening in their community. And they discovered an old lady in her 80s who hadn't been out the door of her house for something like five years. She hadn't crossed the threshold since her husband had died. Uh, she couldn't read or write, and she felt so 
incompetent and hopeless that she just stayed in and her neighbours did all her shopping for her. I went down to that community to hear some community reps talk about it and this old lady was there. And in the middle of the talk, she looked at her watch and she got up and she said, you have to excuse me, I have to go now. And as she walked out, everyone else was smirking and nudging each other. And it turned out that what she had to do was go and lead the belly dancing class at the, the community centre. The fact that those two town planners had been to visit her and had found her in that state they went back and they took biscuits and then they took a cake and they befriended her and gradually she began to feel able again and she engaged. And I've got dozens of stories of people's lives being transformed, not by being told what to do, but by being asked what they needed and being supported in achieving that. That's the way you transform people's lives. Yes, and I, I do I do agree, but I, I know many of you on the call tonight and a lot of your group, um, Carlo and George, will be at the sharp end and you'll be exposed to a lot of anger and sometimes violence. And I do think um, I do think a smile to a patient makes a huge, huge difference if you can manage a smile. But I've also got a vision of when I was um, much younger. Um, actually it was a little old lady decided she didn't like the look of me and went for me and it took four four men to pull her off so um, sympathy 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 when you find yourself in those difficult situations uh, the final question is do you think showing equity and healthcare access to those not currently getting that access contributes to social capital brackets and wellness Yes, is the quick answer. I mean, if people are feeling isolated and alone, helping them with whatever, whether it's access to healthcare, whether it's access to food, whether it's access to friendly company or whatever, that helps them feel better about themselves and helps them engage more with other people. No question. I've just uh, finished writing an article for I do an article on health for uh, the Scotsman newspaper uh, every month. I just finished writing an article on men's sheds. You know about men's sheds? It's an association started in Australia that it basically it's a shed that's got tools and you can go down and you can work away at things. But the thing is, you've got sympathetic companionship. You've got folk there to have a laugh with, to have a cup of tea with and so on. And men are traditionally quite hard to reach um, in, but in health promotion terms. But folk in at Glasgow Caledonian University have just shown that the men's sheds have a very positive effect on health and well-being. And it's about friendliness and access and support. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for all your time on behalf of myself, George, and everyone in the Public Health Forum and everyone that's viewed it today. It's been two really inspiring talks and I'm sure we can take, away, take those away and speak with each other about them. So thank you so much for all your time. Okay, pleasure. Yeah. Nice to see you and um, wish you very well with your forum and hope, hope you have a great time in the future. Thank you, thank you very much.